Hi everyone, welcome to Grand Rounds. I will give folks a couple minutes to continue gathering before introducing the lecture. Hi everyone, I'm Alex Jeffrey. I'm a PGY5 Pete's Neuro Co-Chief President. I would like to welcome everyone to the John K. Barlow Grand Rounds today, given by Dr. Rebecca Eichord. Dr. Kerman and Dr. Barlow were co-residents in child neuro from 1985 to 1988. She is a practicing neurologist with special expertise in diagnosis and treatment of movement disorders in children. Good morning. And welcome to the 34th annual John Barlow Memorial Lecture. John was a colleague and my co-resident in football at Mass General Hospital, class of 1988. This lectureship has been established thanks to the dedication of Mass General Hospital's Neurology Department and the Division of Pediatric Neurology to commemorate John's legacy as an inspiring physician, teacher, and leader. I would also like to acknowledge Dr. Elizabeth Dueling and Carol for their continued efforts each year to ensure the success of this tribute. John graduated from Bowdoin College and Pritzker School of Medicine, University of Chicago. He trained in pediatrics at Boston Children's Hospital and then moved across town to Mass General Hospital for his child neurology residency. Then he completed a neurophysiology fellowship at Boston Children's Hospital and became a faculty member and attending as uh, joining the Boston Children's Hospital epilepsy program. Sadly, his life was tragically cut short just a year later. Don is remembered as a brilliant doctor, a dedicated neurologist, and as a friend. His courage, fortitude, and resilience changed all of those who were fortunate enough to work with him. He was a superb teacher and mentor, and most importantly, he was warm, witty, and kind. John was particularly interested in the neurologic sequelae of heart surgeries, specifically stroke and epilepsy in children with congenital heart disease. He worked with others from Boston Children's Hospital to assess the risk and outcomes of children whose surgery was performed with circulatory arrest versus low flow bypass. So today we are honored to have Dr. Rebecca Eichord present her work on childhood stroke, progress and prospects. Before we begin, though, I would like to present you, uh, Rebecca, with this plaque, which will be sent to you to commemorate oh. um, commemorating you for the lecture in memory of John Barlow's contributions as a child neurologist. So without further, thank you, Dr. Eichord, for joining us and sharing your thoughts today. Well, I want to thank the organizers, in particular, Alex and Dr. Kerman, for your kind words, and Dr. Dooling. Um, I, I can't really say uh, how much of an honor it is to be 
asked to be part of the group of people who've been uh, asked to help uh, memorialize this individual who whose life <laughs> inspired so many. And I'm hoping that uh, what I can share today will live up to that bar. So many thanks to all of you and to this great honor. Um, and a shout out to those of you, <clears throat> sorry, who know me <clears throat> through the stroke community. We think of ourselves as a tight knit, tight knit group, not only of colleagues, but of friends. And if Gabrielle is on there, uh, I want to especially say hello and many, many thanks. Um, she has really inspired me and really drew me into the field of stroke uh, for clinical research and for a friendship that's been uh, really an underpinning of everything that we do as a community. So Gabrielle, if you're out there, cheers and uh, big hugs. So on to the talk. Um, what I've done is really just mainly been a spectator and perhaps some small contribution, but I think what I can offer is a perspective and a thread of continuity over the years of how our uh, how our network of devoted investigators and caregivers has allowed us to make progress in this field. Um, so this is the uh, um, slide I've been asked to present, which is the learning objectives. And it shows up here the code for attendance and phone number and the accreditation. I'll leave it there for just a few seconds. And this can be shown again uh, at the end if people need me to put it back up. So well, I'm Dr. Icord, yeah? while, this, while this slide is up, I would love to give you a full introduction. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I think that you probably be no introduction, um, but I am honored to introduce you. Um, Dr. Eichord is a distinguished neurologist holding the position of Professor of Neurology and Pediatrics at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, affiliated with the Perlman School of Medicine at University of Pennsylvania. She received her BS in biology from the University of Hawaii and her MD from George Washington University. Her extensive medical training includes a pediatric residency and chief residency at Children's National Medical Center, a fellowship in developmental pediatrics at Kennedy Krieger and Johns Hopkins Medical Center, and a child neurology residence, residency at Johns Hopkins Medical Center. Her research activities focus on the pathophysiology of ischemia and hypoglycemia in the developing brain, and she conducted studies in animal models at the Anesthesia Crick Care Laboratory at Johns Hopkins Medical Center under the mentorship of of Dr. Richard Traistman. As a notable figure in the field, Dr. Eichord is a founding member of the International Pediatric Stroke Study and has served as the PI or on-site PI on multiple clinical research studies involving childhood stroke, traumatic brain injury, and post-cardiac arrest encephalopathy. Beyond her research endeavors, she plays a pivotal role in training and mentorship, serving as the co-director of the Pediatric Neurocritical Care Fellowship at CHOP and mentoring numerous residents, fellows, and junior faculty members in their research activities. Dr. Eichord's contribu contributions to both clinical practice and academic pursuits underscore her dedication to advancing the understanding and treatment of pediatric neurology. And now, without even further ado, I'd like to welcome Dr. Eichord and her grand rounds presentation that she's introduced, Childhood Stroke Progress and Prospects. Thank you for your kind words again. So I'll move on. Um, these are the disclosure statements. I have no major disclosures or conflicts of interest. And uh, I've learned from some other speakers that uh, that a good thing to do is to thank everyone in advance, because often at the end of, this, of the talk, you run out of time. So I want to particularly give credit to, uh, well, I've already mentioned the I IPSS and IP um, IPSO collaborators, Heather Fullerton, many people in that network um, at CHOP and Penn, um, my closest associates, Lauren Beslow, Evelyn Shi, and many student uh, study coordinators, my clinical team, CHOP neurology fellows, radiologists, and the UPenn Stroke Center, Scott Kasner, Steve Massey, and Mike Mullen, many of whom may be familiar to some of the adult stroke people who may be in the audience. And all of this is a big network of uh, very collaborative and supportive people who have made uh, this work possible. So uh, it's, it's helpful and, and exciting to recognize that research in pediatric stroke is an international growth industry. And this is already well outdated, but shows you the track uh, 
of uh, research, interest in research and publications that have occurred dating back to the 1980s and particularly taking off in the mid um, aughts and continues to uh, progress along that similar pathway. And as I already mentioned, the International Pediatric Stroke Study established in 2003 was a journey that I was able to join and led by Gabriel de Weber, which uh, was able to enroll or include numerous centers, hundreds of centers from around the world with um, uh, several thousand cases already enrolled as of 2015 and probably about double that now. Um, capturing children with mainly arterial and venous ischemic stroke um, up until this past year when, thanks to the funding and efforts of uh, the American Heart Association Viewer Association, we now have a registry capability to include children with hemorrhagic strokes. So we're now expanding our journey to include uh, this very important subgroup. In addition, there have been uh, old friends coming together in new alliances. I've already mentioned the International Pediatric Stroke Organization, which uh, built on and includes now the International Pediatric Stroke Study. Uh, this is a nonprofit that brings together professionals of all, sub all disciplines, uh, physicians, as well as allied health uh, providers, surgeons, psychologists, and our mission is to expand and build clinical care, research, education, and advocacy. So this was an exciting development about three years ago, and I urge anybody who has an interest in the uh, learning more about uh, how to take care of children with stroke who have interest in um, research in pediatric stroke to please join the IPSO. Um, and then we have also developed alliances with uh, rehabilitation medicine providers. We have now launched two uh, clinical trials through the NIH StrokeNet and the American Heart Association Buer Foundation that Ari mentioned. So our presence um, in uh, the world of researchers and providers and advocacy professionals has grown very steadily and remarkably in the last uh, 15 to 20 years. So I like to start this uh, talk with asking uh, what are the burning issues in childhood stroke? And it should be no surprise that the questions remain similar as they were say 10 to 15 years ago, um, but happily we've made lots of progress in, in shedding light on these questions. So for example, what causes stroke in children? What's the best way to treat uh, acute stroke as well as um, chronic stroke? How do we prevent recurrence? How do we improve outcomes? and what tools and resources do we have for treatment and for research. And happily, there have been lots of additions to what I call our pediatric stroke toolkit. Um, as of uh, the most recent um, publications, we still have mostly consensus-based practice guidelines. We have still limited evidence. So our practice guidelines are really more scientific statements, but these um, documents are, are rich resources for understanding the literature, the state of the art, and where we need to go in the future. We do have a pediatric specific NIH stroke scale. We have a stroke subtype classification system called Cascade, which um, is important in, in, uh, use, in providing a framework for classifying stroke subtypes for any sort of future research. And this combines clinical and imaging data uh, at various time points. We have a uh, validated strategy for grading severity of arteriopathy, which is now standardized and can be used and has been used in publications. And these are some of the tools that are really critical to designing and carrying out rigorous clinical trials. We have outcome measures, the pediatric stroke outcome measure, um, really established and created by Gabrielle de Wever and adopted widely and recognized as the most used and validated tool for measuring in a systematic way the outcome of children who have had stroke. A modified rank and is used widely, but it's not really very well validated. So it's important for people to understand its limitations and to adapt it as best as can be done for children. We have uh, lots of progress in imaging. Vessel wall imaging is used in a number of pediatric stroke studies to help us understand the nature of the pathology. We have perfusion imaging, both uh, CT-based and MR-based, and a variety of other research-based uh, modalities that can help us understand the network disruptions and how these evolve over time in recovery. 
So what is the spectrum of disease? Um, uh, broadly speaking, childhood stroke includes all stroke subtypes. Arterial ischemic stroke is the one most commonly thought about, and this is defined as a clinical deficit in an arterial territory with corresponding infarction on imaging, such as is illustrated by this very large middle cerebral artery uh, uh, stroke on this patient. Um, uh, and combined with arterial ischemic stroke, children certainly do have transient ischemic attacks. These are difficult to pin down, uh, but again, they're defined as a focal neurologic deficit in an arterial territory uh, with an, a negative scan. Then we have primary intracranial hemorrhage. Um, these are not traumatic injuries. These usually are considered to be a hemorrhagic stroke if they're parenchymal, intraventricular, or subarachnoid, and due to uh, cerebrovascular disease. And here's an example um, in this child. Cerebral venous thrombosis is uh, the sort of fourth part of the, of the uh, quartet with thrombotic occlusion of cerebral venous system and may include uh, infarction or not, no infarction. And here's an example of such a case. So how about the epidemiology? This really pertains mainly to arterial ischemic stroke. The incidence overall in Europe and North America is very much age dependent. And if you add up all the age groups, it is estimated to be about two per 100,000 per year with neonates accounting for the very large majority of those at about 20 per 100,000 per year. Infants under a year um, uh, are in a very important subgroup, toddlers, two per 100,000 per year, children, and then teens, there's another sort of late peak of arterial ischemic stroke in adolescents. Modifiers of incidence, I've already mentioned that children um, among childhood stroke, about 25% are uh, occurring in neonates, um, and outside of the neonatal period, the median age of onset is about five to six years. And consistently, males have had a slightly uh, higher incidence than females at about 60% to 40%. We don't really understand why, but that tends to cross all age groups and all stroke subtypes. And there certainly are race and ethnicity uh, factors within the US, Amer African American children accounting for a larger proportion compared to others. So what are the risk factors uh, for arterial ischemic stroke? Um, we started to learn about this from as early as the 1980s and 90s from the seminal study reported from the UK by our colleagues, doctors Ganesan and Kirkham, where they collected uh, children, or collected information in a prospective manner on about 200 children with arterial ischemic stroke and uh, found that of uh, those children, those who were known to have some sort of risk factor for stroke accounted for about half, and those who were previously he healthy were accounted for the other half. And this uh, pattern has more or less persisted over the years with more and more studies contributing this pattern. Of those with a known risk factor prior to the onset of their stroke, um, at, in those years, the largest proportion of those were children with sickle cell anemia. There was a large uh, patient population in England of uh, children with sickle cell. So this somewhat accounted for that. And it also um, was part of the picture prior to the availability of primary prevention. So this picture would look different nowadays with um, the success of primary prevention in children with sickle cell disease. And what you can see is that the cardiac um, disease is the largest of that group where children who were known to have a risk factor, in fact, developed a, a um, stroke. And then of those without a uh, risk factor, um, uh, we learned from this uh, very early registry data that arteriopathies were by, uh, by far the largest subgroup with otherwise or previously undiagnosed cardiac disease being a small um, section. And as well, we saw early on that infection um, or some recent history of infection was an important contributor. So this theme plays out. Um, over subsequent uh, research studies where we're looking to understand these arteriopathies and the role of infection. Um, and on to the results of the International Pediatric Stroke Study, the IPSS, um, which was founded in July, January 2003. And this slide represents data for the first four years. And uh, the US and Canada accounted for the largest number of these cases. Um, 676 cases are shown here. And the uh, stroke subtype where the role or the risk factors uh, for those strokes is shown here. And again, arteriopathy pops out as a uh, the lead player as well as infection. Whoop, 
infection um, also being an important role, having an important role. Uh, we, we uh, in childhood stroke, uh, pay a close attention to thrombophilias as we think these are playing a larger role than they might in adults. And um, true to that uh, thought, a very nice study, mainly from Europe, um, UK, Canada, and Germany, combined data from 672 children with the first arterial ischemic stroke. These are non-neonates and looked at uh, the role of thrombophilia factors in the rate of recurrence. And what they did find is that um, you know, one or more prothrombotic factors uh, did seem to have an effect on re recurrence. So those children with um, a single prothrombotic risk, risk uh, factor had a higher risk of recurrence as compared to those with none shown, shown here in the four years uh, study. And what are those risk factors? Factor V Leiden and lipoprotein A, um, as well as a small contribution from antiphospholipid lipid antibodies rose to the top. Um, these are fairly common factors in uh, non-stroke populations as well. Uh, so it, the exact mechanism by which these factors play a role is not entirely clear because the hematology literature would suggest that many of these factors are more important for venous thrombosis. So exactly how they interact isn't clear, but they often seem to co uh, interact along with some other risk factors, such as a dissection or cardiac disease. So they're thought to be additive and not just acting on their own. Then on to the subtype classification. Um, early on in the definition of these arteriopathies, uh, Dr. Sabir and others um, in especially the European and Canadian groups um, were uh, able to uh, define a classification scheme for understanding the nature of these arteriopathies. And in the beginning, they, they defined non-inflammatory arteriopathies and inflammatory arteriopathies. In the beginning, um, these non-inflammatory arteriopathies were uh, viewed or could be seen basically based on phenotype as having a focal cerebral arteriopathy, uh, cervical, um, mainly cervical, but also some intracranial dissections, moya moya disease, which may be primary or secondary, uh, genetic disorders. And here I want to give a shout out to Dr. Mussolino, who um, is, has been one of the thought leaders and doing uh, important research and helping us to understand the very wide uh, number and increasing variety and subtypes of genetic diseases that can cause arteriopathies in stroke in children. So this, just as an aside, the genetic uh, basis for arteriopathies is, uh, is an area that really deserves lots more work and that we in the stroke community are just beginning to scratch the surface. And then there are the inflammatory arteritides or vasculitides. Um, these are uh, often primary CNS diseases as well as secondary systemic diseases. And what has emerged over the years is that there is some sort of crossover overlap between the focal cerebral arteriopathy and the inflammatory diseases. And this ties in with the theme of a relationship to exposure to infections and uh, the possibility of setting up a transient inflammatory process in the artery that results from that. So um, we, uh, by we, I mean we in the pediatric stroke world and those in the rheumatology world um, have uh, crossed paths and shared ideas and um, used our combined knowledge, I think, to better understand these diseases. This is an example of a child that I encountered very early in my stroke uh, research, a nine-year-old healthy girl developed aphasia and a right hemiparesis, which was not immediately recognized because she tended to be a child who had temper tantrums and uh, had seemed to have a temp to temper tantrum the evening of her onset of symptoms in which she stopped speaking. And then over the course of the night, um, her aphasia became more obvious and her right hemiparesis um, was, was more clear. And here she has on an MRA this area of focal irregular narrowing in the proximal middle cerebral artery. And this is the classic appearance of a focal cerebral arteriopathy. And then two weeks later, that uh, arteriopathy evolved and became somewhat worse, which again is a classic pattern in this particular condition. So uh, what lessons have we learned from the world of research involving these uh, is intersection of arteriopathy, infection, and inflammation? 
there's uh, data epidemiologic as well as case related studies and even pathology that shows us a, an important link and a mechanism between an, a varicella infection and the occurrence of arteriopathy and stroke. So there's certainly epidemiologic data that shows a, a clear association between having had a prior varicella infection and the subsequent develop of focal, development of focal cerebral arteriopathy. In addition, some occasional case reports of, uh, with pathology available shows that the trigeminal nerve can harbor latent uh, VCV virus, and that we know that the trigeminal nerve innervates the distal internal carotid and proximal middle cerebral arteries. So there is a very clear anatomical pathway for uh, viral infection and viral uh, uh, invasion of the arteries. In addition, there's some studies showing in some patients with focal cerebral arteriopathy that CSF can show evidence of prior VCV virus or antibody response. And then there are some autopsy cases showing viral particles in the vessel wall. So all of this uh, gives us a very clear understanding of how uh, viral infection can, um, in, in, can play a role in the development of focal cerebral arteriopathy. And then I, just as a kind of case of interest, encountered a patient who uh, I think demonstrates this even more clearly, a 10-year-old who had a prior um, varicella, sorry, varicella ophthalma, sorry, ophthalmicus infection involving one eye and when she first became ill, she did not have any neurologic symptoms, but several months later, she presented with right middle cerebral artery occlusion and watershed infarcts. And here you can see those infarcts on her MRI and a very pronounced uh, uh, unifocal arteriopathy. And then subsequently, a um, angiogram showed how this re resembles in many ways what we might think of as a unilateral moya moya. So again, looking at arteriopathy, and we ask ourselves, well, how does this play into uh, stroke recurrence? And data from the California Kaiser uh, database, which in, which uh, provides a rich population-based set uh, a resource for studying um, a variety of uh, diseases, <clears throat> including stroke. And Heather Fullerton uh, described this paper way back in 2007, where she was able to identify 181 incident childhood stroke cases. Among them, 97 were in childhood and could, um, could collect data on 16 recurrent strokes. These occurred a median of about two and a half months after incident stroke. And that data... <clears throat> again, clearly shows the importance of arteriopathy, where you can see this survival curve of children who had a prior stroke and had normal vessels had virtually no recurrent stroke versus those who had abnormal vessels on their initial imaging had a very high rate of recurrence. So what is the what is the time course of these focal arteriopathies? And a very exquisite study done in Europe uh, captured results from 79 previously healthy children who had an arterial ischemic stroke at a median age of about five and were found to have this focal arteriopathy. Initially, this was uh, labeled as transient cerebral arteriopathy, but now that terminology has been replaced and is now considered to be focal cerebral arteriopathy. And they did uh, prospective uh, serial imaging on many of these on these patients um, over a period of about 17 months. Um, notably in Europe, about 44% of these cases had post-varicella post arteriopathy. In a way, this is a kind of a natural experiment where um, in that population, um, immunization against varicella was not very commonly used so that uh, the varicella mechanism of arteriopathy was a predominant cause, and this population demonstrates how these patients evolve over time. And what you can see in this uh, flow chart from those 79 patients, they classified their progression over time into three subtypes. One, uh, the normalization, where the imaging showed the vessels normalized in 17 of those cases. In 57 of those cases, the imaging uh, stabilized, which meant that they either um, looked stable or they had some partial improvement or minimal progression as compared to about five, a very small subgroup that actually progressed very significantly. And the rate of recurrence was directly related to the evolution over time in these uh, arteriopathies. And most of the recurrences were within the first six months. And that echoes the theme that was seen in the California data where 
the risk of recurrence seems to be delimited to a very early time frame within the first three to six months. And so what does this uh, help us do? Well, it helps us understand where we need to target our interventions. We need to better understand and target the arteriopathy itself. And we need to do that very early in the first few months so that we can uh, modify the outcome and prevent the recurrences. And these are some of the pictures from the um, angiograms in these children where these uh, regions of uh, disease in the middle cerebral artery showed a beating appearance, which is often considered to be um, inconsistent with an inflammatory process. And then in the same patient, some months later, you can still see this beating and, and abnormality. And this was classified as stable, although arguably one might say this, this actually looks like it might've gotten a bit worse, um, but that's what that picture might look like on uh, imaging. So again, coming back to the theme of the relationship with infection, um, the IPSS uh, uh, data were looked at to understand what risk factors there might be as they relate to infection for arteriopathy. And in this uh, data of about, I can't remember exactly how many patients there were in this, um, but a large uh, several hundred patients where there were risk factors for arteriopathy um, that included sickle cell disease, which is no surprise, but also an exposure to recurrent <clears throat> or recent upper respiratory infection. So it's not just varicella, but some other uh, types of viruses seem to play a role in, uh, in the risk of occurrence of an arterial stenosis or arteriopathy in this, in this uh, study. So um, the, the theme and the data that's building over many years led to the uh, launch of this uh, study looking at the vascular effects of infection in childhood stroke led by Heather Fullerton and carried out by uh, numerous IPSS investigators. And the hypothesis was that infection somehow contributes to vascular injury, which leads to an arteriopathy and local thrombosis and then uh, ischemic stroke and that there is then a resultant arteriopathy and inflammatory markers um, which predict recurrence. So the design was to capture children with arterial ischemic stroke and, and, uh, and notably healthy controls. And they collected or we collected infectious histories, blood and serum samples to look for markers of a viral infections and inflammation. And then uh, for uh, because this is a prospective funded study, they could do central review and classification of imaging and stroke subtype. And then these children were seen for a one-year clinical follow-up. And uh, the significance or the importance of having uh, clinical history and imaging review centrally was really key to uh, being able to assign stroke subtype uh, classification in a systematic and valid way. And you can see here an example of a patient who had a fairly large middle cerebral artery territory infarction and who had abnormal vascular imaging with uh, occlusion of the uh, proximal, sorry, the, yeah, the, the uh, distal internal carotid artery. And just looking at the imaging, one wouldn't really be able to know whether this was a primarily thromboembolic event or whether it was occlusion of a arteriopathy or a dissection. And it was only because um, there could be central review um, that if you include then the clinical history where this patient had known congenital heart disease and an intracardiac thrombus that uh, concluded that this was a cardioembolic stroke. So this was uh, some of the um, really important methodology that could be used and set the standard for subsequent uh, studies. And even later, um, that, uh, that vessel remained occluded um, on follow-up months later. And again, without the history and the knowledge of the full picture, one wouldn't really be able to decide if this was an arteriopathy um, a priori or whether it was an embolic event. Uh, so what did the study find? Um, they were able to recruit 355 children with a median age of onset of stroke of about seven and a half years. Again, a very slight preponderance of males and um, um, about half were previously healthy. This echoes the same picture that we learned from previous registry studies. So it's reassuring to know that our prospective and more recent uh, population or more recent studies um, confirm the overall epidemiologic picture that we learned from our registries. And of the stroke subtypes, they were able to see that about uh, just under half um, had an arteriopathy, um, about a quarter or 20% were cardioembolic, 
about 25% were cryptogenic. And um, this is uh, really important data because these cases were very well investigated. And um, one could say with some certainty um, that all of the stroke risk factors were defined um, uh, as, as were as defined by our current technology. And so again, this pattern is pretty typical of the stroke subtypes. And of the uh, arteriopathies, they were classified again centrally as showing about um, a, a significant proportion were focal cerebral arteriopathy, but really the largest subgroup was, was dissection. And then, uh, no surprise, a very uh, important subgroup was Moyamoya disease, and then a genetic and other uh, vasculitides um, or a secondary vasculitis, such as with proven central nervous system infection, were also in the mix. Uh, this also was helpful information to know what current practices are for antithrombotic treatment. Um, and, and about almost 90%, some sort of antithrombotic treatment was given, um, split fairly uh, uniformly to include antiplatelet as the most common, anticoagulation as the second most common, and in some cases, both. And then they were able to look at cumulative stroke recurrence, which happened in about 12% by one year. This was a bit lower uh, risk or a bit lower uh, rate of recurrence than we had seen from previous observational studies. And uh, we don't really know why that is, but perhaps a more consistent and uh, systematic approach to caring for these children was part of the reason for that. And of the recurrence, uh, pre predictors of recurrence, arteriopathy um, emerged as the most important uh, risk factor with a fivefold uh, risk increased risk compared to idiopathic or cryptogenic. Um, but all of the major stroke uh, vasculopathy uh, subtypes had important risk of recurrence. About a third of uh, patients with moya moya had recurrence, about a quarter with transient, I should say, focal cerebral arteriopathy, and about 20% of those with dissection. So recurrence is an important uh, problem in all children with all types of um, arteriopathies. And again, uh, the question about when the recurrences happened um, is an, another important piece of data to help us design our treatments and uh, counsel families. So about 75% um, in this entire cohort, 75% uh, of the recurrences took place within the first three months. And these were mainly among children with arteriopathies as shown by this uh, solid line. So again, we need to focus on the first three months we need to focus on the arteriopathies um, as the target for our interventions. And so what did they learn in terms of the, re the re relationship with infection? Incident stroke was associated with a history of minor infection, usually minor your, um, upper respiratory infections, and this risk exposure seemed to be fairly delimited to the preceding seven days. So it didn't go back to weeks, many weeks or months. And uh, the importance of having a control group was really highlighted here where they were able to show uh, a difference because there was a comparison group where 18% of children with stroke had a recent minor infection compared to only 3% in controls. And interestingly, this risk uh, or association with infection was present for all the stroke subtypes, not just arteriopathy. So this is a bit of a puzzle and a tantalizing idea to help us understand a little bit, learn more about uh, what infections are doing. And interestingly, um, and importantly for public health um, policy, there was a lower compliance with routine vaccination in children who had incident strokes. So this is a, a very important bit of data to use in our counseling of families about the necessity of and importance and benefit of getting routine vaccinations. Um, socioeconomic factors were also important where children uh, from um, black, uh, uh, ch uh, black children had a higher risk of stroke and children living in rural compared with urban had a higher incidence of stroke. So we need to pay attention to um, socioeconomic and, uh, and uh, social uh, determinants of health in these um, studies. What is the role of infection? So there was serological evidence of some sort of acute herpes virus infection that really confirms the theme established by the um, prior varicella studies uh, of the 187 uh, cases who had acute and convalescent blood samples. About 45% had some sort of biomarker of an acute herpes infection with herpes simplex one being the most common. And interestingly, most of those infections were asymptomatic. So viruses are all around us, as we know, and in, in pediatric populations, they're probably even more common than in adults. 
So it's the thought, the thought is that, or the data shows that herpes viruses may act as a trigger for all stroke subtypes, even if it's subclinical. So the conclusions, arteriopathies uh, pose the greatest risk of recurrent stroke. The therapies need to direct be directed at arteriopathies. We need to understand the triad of infection, inflammation, thrombosis. Um, and this led to the launch, and as well as other data, to the launch of two um, important trials of steroids, which uh, are now commonly used as clinical practice in treating focal arteriopathies. Um, in Europe and Australia, the PASTA trial is looking at uh, this in a controlled, um, placebo-controlled manner. And very soon, uh, we, are we are launching the uh, focus trial in the U.S. to look at um, steroids um, as a potential benefit or potential benefit in arteriopathy. Um, and yet, we still need to know more. We need better, we need to use, and we need better imaging and biomarker tools to understand the nature and staging of arteriopathies. Um, this has led to the development of arteriopathy severity scoring and um, the exploration of uh, vessel wall imaging to help us understand these uh, conditions. Uh, it, would, it was natural to ask the question, what was the impact of COVID-19 on pediatric stroke? And my colleague um, worked with many IPSS investigators in 2020 to uh, survey the rate of ischemic stroke, the exposure to COVID, patient-level data, looking at relationships between stroke and COVID and the number of patients hospitalized with COVID. And um, as well, this, uh, the, there was a follow-up study to the vascular effects of infection in pediatric stroke called VIPS-2, which uh, followed onto the COVID uh, survey study and captured data both pre and during the COVID um, pandemic. And this turned out to be a natural experiment where um, the VIPS um, investigators were capturing data on, on biomarkers and um, control subjects. And some of that data was presented just last week at the International Stroke Conference. Um, so I'll show you, just share with you the trends from the original survey data. This collected data from January to May, 2020. So that was very early and during the pandemic and there was no actual uh, uh, significant increase in the number of strokes, um, the proportions um, of strokes that were positive for COVID were fairly low. So children seem to have been fairly protected against COVID, hopefully due to public health measures and isolations. And of the eight strokes that occurred in 971 COVID hospitalizations, um, only 0.82% of children hospitalized with COVID had a stroke, and this was similar to adult data. I can't really share specific data from uh, the VIPS-2 trial, but it looks as though there was a mixed effect of the COVID pandemic. On the one hand, isolation uh, prevented uh, and lowered the exposure of children to common uh, viral illnesses, so that may have or may have contributed to a dip or a decrease in the infection-related um, uh, strokes. And, and then as uh, children who were exposed to COVID perhaps later developed some effect of the COVID on their um, incident strokes, there may be uh, some sort of a, a sort of dual signal there and more, more to be learned as uh, the VIPS2 data is published. So keep your eye on that. I think I'll skip this in the interest of time. Um, we. Uh, looked at a uh, recurrence rate in posterior circulation stroke. Those of us who practice in the field of pediatric stroke often have these vexing cases of children with posterior circulation stroke, often due to vertebral artery dissection, and they have a fairly high risk of recurrence in our population of children with posterior circulation stroke. Um, a nine of 46 cases had a recurrence, and again, most of these recurrences were very early on compared to um, only a 3% recurrence rate in anterior circulation stroke. So um, there are many challenges related to posterior circulation stroke and particularly cervical artery dissection, which remain to be um, more uh, fully understood and researched. So um, I'm going to move on to treatment. And I borrow, uh, we borrow heavily from our understanding of stroke treatment from the adult uh, stroke circulate or adult stroke community, and we know that uh, the physiology tells us that the treatment should have several pillars. 
Uh, the first being uh, restore and maintain circulation and uh, reperfusion. The next is neuroprotection. What can we do to limit the core and salvage the penumbra? And then third is rehabilitation. Children are uh, very well known to have a great deal of plasticity. So how can we optimize um, and leverage their, their tendency to recover in the most uh, favorable way? And then we have to think about secondary prevention as you can see from all the previous um, studies that I quoted. So um, for many years, we in the pediatric stroke community and in adults have been uh, hopeful that uh, thrombolysis could play a role. Um, and uh, we, because the, because the window is so short and because uh, pediatric stroke remains a fairly low um, prevalence disease, uh, designing a trial to evaluate thrombolysis was a big challenge. Nonetheless, it was tried. Um, and what we were able to do is collect data from 16 sites who were in the initial thrombolysis trial, who reported data on all children that were treated with thrombolysis between 2013 and 2018, and safety data were collected and analyzed. And this was really important because Many of us really were uncertain about the safety of thrombolysis in children. And so if we could at least get some safety data from a prospective observational study, then that would uh, move us uh, along. So of the 16 sites who collected data from two, for five years, there were 26 children who received thrombolysis for acute stroke. Their median age was 14. And this theme I think recurs in thrombectomy data that children who are, are eligible and come to us within a window tend to be in the teenage years. Although in this uh, study, there were children as young as one year who, um, who presented early enough um, and were able to receive this therapy. And their median stroke scale score was 14, which is fairly high, but not um, extremely high. The stroke, stroke subtypes uh, crossed the uh, uh, a spectrum with a significant number being cardioembolic, uh, very many of them being cryptogenic, a few of them, very few of them being focal cerebral arteriopathy, and that's a story in and of itself. Uh, but again, most of these were not um, children with focal cerebral arteriopathy, and children with moya moya disease generally don't get this type of therapy. And they were able to receive their thrombolysis within a median age range, a median range of three hours and only out to four and a half hours. So in line with um, with the uh, guidelines, 50% uh, were treated at a local hospital and then referred to a subspecialty care. And so here are the safety data that really was um, helpful and reassuring. There was asymptomatic hemorrhage in 7% and none of these children had symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage. Uh, one patient had epistaxis. So the safety data is reassuring, at least in terms of how people were have been using thrombolysis in um, these patients. And I should say that um, the protocol used and the guidelines used for giving thrombolysis were fairly systematic and were in line with adult criteria in regards to um, time from last seen well, um, exclusion criteria, and um, the dosing and uh, timeline of follow-up. So the conclusions were the overall risk of symptomatic hemorrhage given uh, for children given intravenous thrombolysis is fairly low as long as it's done within the um, established guide guidelines at that time. Um, many people now wonder whether tenecteplase has a role. I'm not going to really present any data because it's too early and there are many barriers and challenges to using tenecteplase. So I would just say keep your eye on that literature going forward. It's not, it's not straightforward. I'll skip that one. Now, how about thrombectomy? Um, uh, we in the pediatric stroke have embraced, uh, field have embraced this therapy and have worked very hard to bring the benefits of this therapy to children. Um, as with thrombolysis, uh, we have many challenges in terms of understanding which children should be considered to be eligible, what's the safety, uh, what data, uh, what um, patients should get it, what are the limitations? And in most cases, um, the time window is at least within that first six hour time window. And in recent, uh, about the last year or so, as the time window has been extended in adults, many pediatric centers are also adopting a longer time window. The lower age limit is basically limited to the size of the vessel and the current technology and devices 
can be used in children as young as one year, but below that, um, the reperfusion devices are very limited. Um, and then we do uh, require a large vessel occlusion uh, to be demonstrated on imaging. Uh, CT and CTA is the easiest and quickest way to demonstrate that occlusion and often is the only imaging modality available for certain um, high-risk populations such as the cardiac population. Um, also rapid, uh, rapid sequence MRI is very commonly uh, used in many pediatric centers. And then the hope is that there is viable tissue to preserve. And that's kind of where the conundrum is. How does one decide in a pediatric population in a very short time window with a, a significant stroke scale score, is there viable tissue to preserve? The limitations and unknown I've already mentioned. It's uncertain as to how to apply the current adult perfusion imaging criteria to children. Uh, should one use or can one use parallel or tandem treatment with thrombolysis? The logistics and resource utilization for a low frequency, uh, very high resource utilization procedure is daunting in many cases. And as I said, risks and safety data are limited. Um, I want to uh, give a shout out to, again, the Canadians who have uh, really been uh, thought leaders and uh, rigorous uh, researchers. And this recent study uh, from the Canadian group described a group of ma uh, matched case control uh, cases of children who were identified from pooled registry data from five tertiary um, hospitals from uh, 2011 to 2022. And uh, these captured children who were between age one month and 18 years who had large vessel occlusion stroke. And of those uh, patients, there were 31 children who had thrombectomy and 46 control patients. This is a really big, uh, as far as pediatric stroke cases go, a, a really important um, uh, study because they had control patients and thrombectomy patients. And the outcome measure, or the endpoint was the primary outcome uh, fun was the functional clinical status at three months. They measured this with a pediatric modified Rankin scale and they used some very creative and um, and interesting ways to come up with a uniform measure um, based on a variety of uh, primary source data. And so I think this is a very good model for how pediatric stroke outcome studies um, could be done with a, a kind of limited and with observational data. So kudos to this group. So what did the data look like? The median age was 12 years. Again, this is uh, tending to be into the uh, adolescent group as compared to the more typical pediatric stroke median age of onset of about five to seven years. Um, again, the cardioembolic and the cryptogenic were the major uh, stroke subtypes and dissection in a few cases. They had a, a, a modest uh, stroke scale score pretreatment of 12 and Actually, that's a significant. And then they had immediate improvement with a post-treatment score of four, four to six. And the time to recanalization was fairly broad. And you can see here that only about half were able to be recanalized within six hours, and the remaining were spread out over as, as late as about 24 hours and the rare case um, beyond 24 hours. So the, um, the current practice of thrombectomy in pediatrics is stretching over a 24-hour time frame. And I think that's the direction that people are going to go. The rate of recanalization was very good with a good uh, TICI score of 90%. Um, these were children with big strokes. So despite their treatment, many of them ended up having a hemicraniectomy, both in the patients and in the controls. And then the outcome at three months measured by the stroke, by the uh, pediatric modified Rankin showed, um, as one would hope, a superior outcome in the thrombectomy patients compared to the um, non-thrombectomy patients. So I think this demonstrates that, um, that uh, thrombectomy is, uh, is uh, an accepted and uh, expected now, increasingly expected mode of treatment. And we're hoping that future studies, another one that's um, being launched soon uh, out of Stanford to understand better what the predictions of, of recovery and the best way to select patients will be forthcoming. Thrombectomy and acute stroke treatments are not the only treatments. We um, he rely heavily on antithrombotic treatments. And this study uh, from, uh, again, the IPSS looked at antithrombotic treatments. What are current practices? What are the benefits? What are some prognostic factors in arterial ischemic stroke? And in this study, 33 centers um, uh, submitted data 
on uh, a variety of children. And what you can see is that clinical practices on antithrombotic treatment are quite variable. And um, you'll see in Canada that a very uh, large proportion are initially started on, on anticoagulation. Um, in the US, it's more mixed with a third, about a third, a third, a third. And this is already fairly old data. And if one were to repeat this uh, study today, one might see some shifts. Um, but I think the point here is that we have limited data to tell us what to do and that this is an area that's ripe for research and would be very beneficial to have um, more prospective data um, on what is the best antithrombotic therapy. But as you can understand, antithrombotic therapy is only one part of the treatment picture. And despite our best efforts to, uh, to use antithrombotic therapy, the recurrence rates are still going to be determined probably by other things than by uh, thrombosis. The landscape of outcomes, um, I'm just going to touch on this. This is worth uh, three hours of conversation. Mortality is still an important factor, although most children uh, recover from their stroke. It remains among the top 10 um, causes of death. And by this, I'm referring to all stroke subtypes, including hemorrhage and venous thrombosis. Um, the outcomes, uh, despite all our best efforts and despite the fact that children have a great deal of plasticity, about 60% still have permanent disability. And as you can imagine, this stretches out over an entire lifetime. So the overall public health impact and the impact for that child is very significant. Children with early life stroke, particularly perinatal stroke, really grow into their impairments and one must look at them into childhood uh, before one has a complete picture. Epilepsy occurs as a very important outcome. It's um, uh, quite prominent in perinatal stroke with 20 and perhaps is up to 40% over their entire uh, lifetime may develop epilepsy in comparison to childhood onset stroke where the occurrence of epilepsy is much lower. And I've already talked a lot about recurrence. I'm gonna skip that. So recovery and rehabilitation. Um, great work is being done on uh, rehabilitation, particularly by Adam Curtin and his group in Canada. You should see some of their papers and look at some of their uh, some of their um, videos. They have developed very novel and very um, effective constraint-induced and by manual-induced movement therapy. There's gait training. There's combination with uh, transcranial uh, stimulation and intensive therapy. And there even now are brain-computer interfaces that uh, seem like something out of science fiction, um, but these are therapies that are in the, uh, in the pipeline and hopefully will be more and more explored and adopted in pediatric stroke because we have lots of time and lots of uh, stakes um, to help them. And importantly, we know those of us who work in this field and anyone who's a pediatrician knows that recovery is not just up to the child. It really plays out in the family and in the school and uh, neurocognitive and neurobehavioral uh, uh, sequelae are among the most problematic and the most difficult to manage. And um, when one can manage them, what can have a really important impact on the child's quality of life. So there is a very big role for education liaison and for family support and community advocacy. So here again, social determinants of health come in and may outweigh anything that we do medically. So these uh, can't be overemphasized in terms of paying attention to them and caring for them. Um, and these are some of the things I've already mentioned. Hopefully we'll develop cognitive rehabilitation strategies. Hopefully one day we'll learn more about epileptogenesis and uh, learning ways that we can prevent or, or mitigate the impact of epilepsy. And again, the importance of treating the whole child in their home and in their school environments and their behavioral health. A shout out to the IPSO. I know um, Canada is, uh, or Toronto is uh, hosting the next uh, IPSO Congress and our mission is really to impact the lives through research, education, care and advocacy. And this has been a great, um, a great advance for the care of children with stroke. And with that, I'll close. Thank you for your attention. Do you want me to answer questions in the chat? Yes, please. Okay. So there's a question about how often do pediatric stroke patients at CHOP present in the time window that makes acute intervention feasible? Um, well, our 
uh, our protocol has been fairly conservative. And so we have to date only treated children within the six hour window. We'll probably expand that. So with that caveat, and in knowing that we're a tertiary care hospital where most of our stroke patients um, come from outside, we treat maybe two per year, but we evaluate maybe six per year. And almost all of those come from our in-hospital cardiac population. But again, with um, the uh, availability uh, of, um, well, with more recent data, we'll likely expand that and double the number to a greater time window. And they're almost all thrown back to me. Let's see, is there another question? Oh, okay. Any other questions? Patty, yes. Sorry, or who, and that's the the Mussolino lab. Uh, to all of you, I have really appreciate again uh, tribute to the inspiration for this talk, Dr. Um, Dr. Barlow, your your uh, colleague who you lost so prematurely, and hopefully all of you will uh, be further inspired to continue work in this uh, in this area and. Um, continue to be expired both by your local people as well as by uh, others. What do we do with, with uh, I assume you mean focal cerebral arteriopathy and thrombectomy? Hi, Patty. Yeah, that's a real conundrum. Um, I, I, I think we would consider doing a thrombectomy in a child who has a large vessel occlusion. What we can't really know when we have a CTA, we, it's often impossible to know if there is an underlying focal cerebral arteriopathy. So I think it's up to the um, skill and um, judgment of the angiographer when they get in there and they start to uh, see the what the image what the vessels look like on angiography. They may be able to see that in fact it probably is a focal cerebral arteriopathy, in which case they would most people that I've talked to who work in this field would tend to back away and not instrument that that vessel. Thank That's you so a good much, question. Doctor, and it's a it's a big it's a tough it's a tough nut to crack. <laughs> I don't see any other questions in the chat or Q and A. Uh, thank you so much for coming and thank you for the excellent talk. Yeah, I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person, but perhaps I'll make another trip that way or pass that way on my way up to Toronto <laughs> <It's> <laughs> these <sounds> days. Good. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Thank you.